Friends, welcome. We are so glad that you have come to join us for this pre-recorded condensed version of this Sunday's service for September 27th here at First Presbyterian Church of Bryan. As we begin to transition more regularly to a live stream practice, you'll notice that we will have pre-recorded versions that are much more condensed. So today, in this version of worship, we don't have our musicians with us. If you wish to tune in to our live worship service, please tune in at the time of the service at 8.15 this morning. Today, what you will hear are prayers, the sermon, another prayer, and the charge and benediction. We hope that you enjoy this worship service with us. Let us pray. We bless your holy name, O God, and acknowledge how we have heard your command to love you, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. Yet we fall into patterns of shallow devotion, false kindness, and self-doubt. We have heard your call to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you, Yet we're drawn to safety, not justice, to apathy, not kindness, to pacing, not walking. Hear our prayers, O God. Forgive us for what we have done and for what we have left undone. Hear our prayers and move us to deeper trust and more faithful action. We come before you now in a time of silence with all that weighs on our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers. Amen. Thanks be to God whose grace transcends the bounds of sin and whose love lifts us up to new life. Amen. Friends, today we explore the second great end of the church, shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. So listen now for the word of God from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord the God, your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. So, which of these three do you think 
was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We all know and recognize this scripture. A lawyer, an overthinker, a man obedient to the letter of the law asks Jesus what he can do to obtain eternal life. And Jesus asks him what he already knows. Well, the man already had the answer, but he really just needed affirmation that he indeed did have the right answer. And furthermore, he wanted to know that it was airtight, that he had the instructions neatly wrapped with a bow on top, that yes, he was going to obtain eternal life. And Jesus, in his way, gives the man a parable. This is the Good Samaritan. Now, in the story, we see that religious figures are not always holier than thou, that society is and always has had caution and rules around it, and that humanity is not always kind and caring. We also see someone who went out of their way to the injured man to be to him what he hoped someone would be for him if found in the same situation. The Samaritan was kind. Now, being kind and being nice are two different things. Being nice requires no investment of care or concern for another person. It's, it's like a mask that we wear to get us through social situations. To be nice is to wear a smile when we don't need to and to coast across the upper crust of an encounter. And when we're nice, we walk away knowing that we did in fact contribute to making a more pleasant atmosphere, but we also walk away not having really given anything nor gained anything from that interaction. Now to be kind is to show compassion towards someone else, whether it's to recognize their humanity and maybe ask their name or genuinely want to know about their day, or maybe it's to help someone who's having trouble crossing the road, carrying their groceries, or maybe you help someone to learn a new skill. To be kind is to open oneself up to forming a relationship that can grow beyond pleasantries. Sometimes we forget in our faith that we are called to be more than just nice people. We are called to be kind, and it is better to be kind. And that requires us to step it up and actively seek to make this world a better place by being better people within it and being better people with other people. We need to remember what it is to be present with someone, to connect in ways that grow from kindness, to plant seeds and to nurture them. And perhaps then the world person by person, could heal a little bit more to finally making its way to becoming a safe and harmonious existence. Now, I'd like to bring today's parable into perspective of the modern day through a situation that at first might seem familiar. I'd like you to meet Alex, a kind eighth grader who was walking home from school one day when he noticed a boy ahead of him had tripped and dropped all of the books that he was carrying, along with two sweaters, a baseball bat, a glove, and his smartphone. Now Alex knelt down and he helped the boy to gather up all the scattered articles, carefully placing them into his arms. And since they were going the same way, he helped him to carry part of the burden. Now as they walk, Alex discovers that the boy's name is Wes, and he was also in the eighth grade. He loved video games, baseball, and history, but he was having a lot of trouble with his other subjects. And he also found out that Wes had just broken up with his girlfriend. Now, Alex went home after dropping Wes off at his house, and they continued to see each other around school, and they would have lunch together once or twice in a week, and then both of them went on to graduate from junior high and they ended up in the same high school where they had brief contacts over the years. But finally, the long-awaited senior year came, 
and just three weeks before graduation, Wes asked Alex if they could talk. Wes reminded him of the day years ago when they had first met. Do you ever wonder why I was carrying so many things home that day? Asked Wes. You see, I cleaned out my locker because I didn't want to leave a mess for anyone else. I was going home to commit suicide. See, my mom had gathered up all of these sleeping pills and so I, I had been storing them away for myself and, well, after we spent some time together talking and, and laughing, I realized that if I had killed myself, there were so many things that I was going to miss. So you see, Alex, when you picked up my books that day, you did a lot more. You saved my life. Kindness is like a seed that can grow when nurtured into something beautiful. Now, unfortunately, reputable nonprofit studies that were conducted in June of 2020, this year, they report that during COVID-19, suicidal contemplation in adults aged 18 to 24 has increased by 25%, in essential workers by 21.7%, and in minority groups as much as 18%. Among non-paid caregivers of adults, the studies report that the percentage has tripled. And due to economic stress, social isolation, loss of community, barriers to mental health treatment due to the restrictions that, I mean, we can't just walk into a hospital and seek help. There's so many rules now. And, and the political stressors and suicidal contemplation and suicide rates have just skyrocketed in comparison to the recent years. This is alarming. And just this month, this month, September, another study was done on teen suicide rates and rates of suicidal ideation. The study states that one in every five teenagers in the United States has seriously considered suicide during the time of COVID-19 in the United States. Imagine a classroom of 25 students. Now subtract five. This is frightening. In my own life as a teen, I lost three close friends to suicide within a two year span. And it is not easy to detect when someone is so hopeless as to contemplate such a horrendous action. Now, in the wake of the tragedies in my own life story, all of my friends from high school and I felt adrift for several years. We, we had lost all control of what we thought was secure and good. Now, I recently met up with an old friend who was there for it. And in speaking with him about what we knew of all those that were in our friend group from that time, we realized just how messed up everything was. Each of us had chosen paths that were actually a response to losing our loved ones. And some had chosen drugs and, and others clung to alcohol and others just completely disappeared. I mean, off the map, we haven't heard from them at all. And I was the one that held on for dear life to Jesus. That's why I'm a minister. And still we wonder and we feel guilt. If only we had been kinder, if only we had paid more attention, if only, if only, if only. And I got so tired of the if onlys. I'm still so tired of the if onlys. That's why I chose ministry. This was my way of forcing myself into becoming that person that had to be held to higher standards of genuinely caring and attending to all people, to being truly kind, so that I may never have to ask myself, if only, ever again. If I could be someone that was there for a struggling teen or a struggling adult, 
I could put a band-aid, maybe, on these things that might lead to suicidal contemplation. If, if I could just give someone enough love to let them know that they're not alone. If I could just help someone to know that God loves them as the most precious of jewels, well, it'll never bring my friends back. I know that. But maybe it could help prevent another from going through with it. And that is worth everything. We never know the burdens that another carries. You know, most carry their burdens with a smile on their face. And it, it doesn't mean that if they're smiling, those burdens aren't heavy. We'll never know completely what is in another person's mind or what is in another person's soul. But we can be loving and we can be kind. We, we can be more than just nice or proper. To be truthful, all of the if-onlys in the world may still not have saved my friends. All the kindness and compassion and love and care may not have stopped them from going through with it. But what I live with now is the realization of just how valuable every single moment, every interaction can be. I choose to strive every day to be kind, even when it is most difficult. And I will never know, I may never know if it helps. But I pray and I hope. The man in the ditch had physical injuries. And it's important to know that not every injury is visible and not everyone has a ditch that can be seen. All of us at some point are the person that are found in that low place. And all of us always have a duty to be the person who reaches out a hand in kindness every single time. We never know the true struggles of another person, but we do get to choose how to love them. So let's love them like neighbors. Imagine a world in which people did not condemn one another so readily. A world in which we could count on others to be kind. A world in which we could disagree and still know the humanity in another person. A world in which we treated all other peoples as beings in our family, as our dear ones. This is what God desires of us. Simply be kind. Do not stop to inquire whether a person deserves kindness. Do not stop to ponder their skin color, religion, race, age, political preference, their nationality, class status, and education level are not qualifiers for your love. Christians, be kind. The world needs us to be kind. Jesus needs us to be kind. That is our charge and our path to knowing God. Walk humbly, for God is everywhere. God knows the heart and God loves all those around us. Seek justice and mercy, for that is kindness. Love kindness and love will find you in all things. It has been said that when we stare out at the world and we seek to change it, we feel small and incapable. But if we just go home and loved the ones that we encountered, the world would be changed significantly. That's all that it takes to make the world a better place. Just a little bit of love. The choice to seek kindness. If we seek kindness every day and we choose love and we choose to be consistent in both, just imagine if everyone did that. So begin there. 
Throw out the rules that would prevent you from being kind, and you may find the world a little bit smaller and love to be a whole lot bigger. So, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Christians, go and do likewise. Amen. Let us pray. O one upon the throne of the universe, outpouring your very self in redeeming love among all persons of all backgrounds and in all times and places, receive our thanks for your gifts too many for us to count or to remember. Grant that your mercies and power to transform life are experienced by each of us and all others in the processes of giving and receiving. Deliver each individual and every group from fears and self-absorption, from envy and resentment, from apathy and miserliness, from chronic illness, and injuries which linger, physical and emotional, from painful words uttered and heard. With compassion, tenderness, and strength, O source of goodness, heal and save as only you can. In the way and spirit of Jesus Christ, change and guide us to cherish your wisdom, to sense the communion you create among those of past and present, those known and unknown to us. To embrace your majestic desire for communities of respect and peace. And to celebrate the risks of discipleship you encourage us to exercise. As Jesus taught disciples in his time and later to believe and give voice, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, when you go out into the world today, remember to choose love and to seek kindness and to have consistency in both. And love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So Christians, go and do likewise. And do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.